The English legal system has a very long history and it should be said at the start that the History of English Law module is very much not going to cover all of it. We focus on topics which are related to other modules on the LLBs. The majority of the course is about private law, so we look at the history of contract, we look at the history of tort, and we look at the history of property and trusts. We also spend a bit of time on the history of criminal law. We more or less take for granted on the LLB there's a court system and this is how it works. For the history of English law, we actually have to turn around and say, well, actually, to start with, there isn't a court system. Where does it come from? Where do the courts get their powers from? How do they work? which enables you to then understand all the material for the later parts of the course, because you need to understand the institutional context. But also we find that this institutional side interacts with the development of the doctrinal concepts and the doctrine in practice. So you've got to have both to really understand what's going on. Legal history is an option to choose for a variety of reasons. One reason I find history very interesting and I want to do some history on my degree, I haven't been doing very much of it. That's a good reason to choose the module. If you want something more than that, then we could start thinking about how this would impact on the way you'd actually think, maybe as a modern lawyer. Legal history helps you understand some of the material you've already covered, so that perhaps it makes a bit more sense. It's sort of in that sense like philosophical foundations of the common law, where you're trying to understand the common law philosophically. Here we're trying to understand it historically. So we will see, for example, in the module, that there's a very good historical explanation as to why the English law of contract gives damages as its primary remedy for a breach of contract. You get monetary compensation for the loss caused by the breach, rather than, as is the case in a lot of other legal systems, the primary remedy is actually enforcement of the contract. And we call that specific performance and we see it as exceptional. Other legal systems see that as the default and the normal remedy. And the reason for that change is due to certain procedural and other shifts which happen more or less from about 1400 to 1600. So it's a purely historical explanation. You start to have a deeper understanding of things that you in fact already know. Sometimes though actually what you find is that you really don't understand or you can't relate what you already know to what we cover. So actually it's a very different world and that's also quite helpful. It makes you realise that there's a lot you haven't learned but that you can pick it up and that you can understand it quite quickly and that you can see that there are different ways of doing things. That the way we do it is not predetermined and there are alternative possibilities which if you're interested in law reform or you're trying to argue for an alternative take on the law at some point in the future is a valuable skill to have. The study of legal history is about change and it's about how law changes and why law changes. And that's useful for everybody who works with or within a legal system to think about. You'd be thinking about what influences do we have on the legal system? Is it purely driven by internal pressures, the ideas that maybe lawyers have or they find in books? Is it driven by external pressures? Is the economy promoting change? So we do think, for example, about does the Industrial Revolution have a major impact on contract law? Or does contract law affect the Industrial Revolution, so the other way around? So we could have those broader perspectives on how the law works. Does the English legal system pay attention to foreign legal systems or alternative legal systems? Does it look to non-legal ideas to influence what's happening? It's valuable for understanding law as an intellectual construct, but also as a societal one. One of the important things you do need to think about in legal history is why people want to change, and in fact, which people want to change. Sometimes change might be driven, for example, by the needs of individual litigants. In effect, a client comes to a lawyer and says they want to do something, and the lawyer explains that isn't currently possible, so you get a push to change the law to enable this to happen. And when we're thinking about that as historians, we say well, we're thinking about this as historians, and we're just demonstrating that the pressure for change is coming from recognising that individuals want the legal system to do something it can't easily do. What that requires you to do, though, is to be able to put yourselves in the shoes, not of a lawyer, but of a lawyer's client. It is what, in fact, a modern law firm would call commercial awareness. It's reflecting the environment in which the client or the individual is working rather than the lawyer, trying to understand that and appreciate how that might then impact on what the lawyers involved need to do. All about putting it into context, but that context requires you to be able to think like people who aren't just the lawyers in the legal system, which is always a valuable skill. It's an interesting course which will require you to think differently about things and that's a very good thing for undergraduate students to do. If you want to do that, then this is a great module for you.